Thank you for being here, Jamie, and yeah. thanks for your inspiring words. So as I mentioned, I'm from COIL, which is a center for online innovation and learning, mm -hmm. and we do this program called COIL Perspectives. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned uh, this year our focus is around student retention, mm -hmm. and uh, we know this is a big issue across. Now, do you mean student retention of like what they remember or student retention actually oh, keeping them here? I've never been asked that question. That's a really good question. Good <laughs> right. question. Uh, this one is really uh, dealing with student persistence. So. So keeping the student within their course experience mm -hmm. and then keeping them within their program so that they're successfully completing whatever degree yeah. or so forth. So it's more about that. But I, I like the other frame that you're suggesting as right. well, retention of material. So with the idea of student retention and persistence, can you just describe to me a little bit about what that means to you when I describe it that way? What does that reflect for you? Yeah, I, uh, to me, this is an important topic, right? So if you are a low income, uh, and I don't even like to use the word low income, but if you're a poor kid, right? If you're a poor black or Latino kid and, um, and you really, you have high potential, right? You test really well, you get good grades, all the traditional things that we look for. You know, you have a 16% chance of going to college and then an 8% or 9% chance of actually finishing college, right? So, so student retention from a minority perspective, from a low income perspective is absolutely critical. And we're starting to see some of that research that suggests uh, that kids are coming to college even though they test well and they do well with very low expectations of themselves. And so the first time they get a bad grade, right? Because they, they, they're the masters of their schools, right? They got straight A's or whatever, and then they get a C. That fits the narrative that they heard their whole lives, right? Which is, you know, you're, you can't do this. You're, you don't belong here, you know, those types of things. And so having, learning, teaching kids how to, how, to, how to master failing something and iterating it and getting better at it is absolutely critical. But that support is, is absolutely necessary for kids who are growing up like that because they need, to, they need to see that, especially if they're walking around campus and they don't see a lot of kids that look like them, mm -hmm. right? That narrative of you don't belong here, even though no one's actually saying that to them, is something that's been uh, pushed into their heads their whole lives. And so being able to, to, to give them the support that they need along the way, uh, especially for those kids, is absolutely critical. That's a great response. Um, so maybe that's going to feed into the next question, which is if you had your druthers, uh, what, would, what would a retention system look like for, for let's just stay with that student maybe mm -hmm. as a good example. Right. What would we do for them to help them through achieve their academic goals? Yeah, and so some of the stuff's already been researched and there's evidence on what to do, right? So there's evidence, UT did a great study around how uh, if you give them positive positive messages, if you if you if you do the mm -hmm. whole like I'm like you kind of thing, right? You film a guy like me that says, "When I was in school, I did this and I failed at this and I did this well," and to give them that you belong thing, right? So being able to provide them the support, a mentor along the way, right? Mm -hmm. if, if I had all the unlimited resources, I would uh, provide a mentor, um, a tw you know, 24 hours a day, like a concierge service mm -hmm. to to those students, so that they had someone that they can go to for feedback, for help, for support, those types of things. And then the last thing is we have to start looking at the traditional model of learning and think about what that looks like. So for example, right, again, um, let's look at some numbers, right? So let's look at Latinos, right? One in, I said this earlier, one in four kids in K-12 is Latino. It's one in three, we're headed to one in three. One in two in many states like California and Arizona and Texas. Um, so look at those numbers in the population and what we have, what our labor pool looks like. And then think about the fact that only 13% of Latinos have a college degree and only 4% of us have a master's degree. Um, you know, all of a sudden now you're seeing that the labor pool isn't as, as, isn't as full as we need it to be. And so how do we increase those numbers? The traditional model that we have for college suggests that, you know, little Johnny graduates high school, we pack up his box, put him in the, in the wooden station wagon and drive him off to college, right? Mm -hmm. um, why do we do, why do we think that that's gonna work for the next generation, right? And so if you think about a Latina who lives in South Phoenix or South, uh, or, or South Texas, for example, let's say she's that first kid that's high potential, good grades, um, and can basically go to any select school that she can't, that she wants to go to, and she goes to her father and says, hey, I got it. I'm going to go to Princeton or Harvard or Stanford or Penn State or wherever. And father's going to say, no, you're not going there. You're staying home and taking care of your brothers and sisters. Right. Um, that's the reality for a lot of Latino kids, especially Latinas. Right. So how how is it that we can start 
thinking about co bringing college to them, right? And how do we extend that learning model so that it's not maybe four years, maybe it's six years, maybe it's two years now and three years later or whatever that looks like, but we have to rethink what that, what that is given the generation of students that are coming into our schools. I really appreciate that response and it, and it leads very nicely into, uh, so that, that sounds like a great system to build and maybe we're on our way. Mm -hmm. um, but what's one thing we can do as higher education to, to take one step toward that kind of an environment? Well, I would say know your students, right? Mm -hmm. Know who they are and what, what are their fears. Right? Like we often talk to kids about what are their strengths and we talk to them about what they're good at, but we don't ever talk to them about what they fear, what they're, what they're scared of, right? And so you might find that a lot of kids are fearful of getting bad grades or fearful of failing a test mm -hmm. or fearful of not doing a presentation well. If we can start understanding where those fears are and start providing support, and it's very simple things like a positive message or a connection with an, a student that's on campus, right? A buddy program. These are the simple things that we can do. Um, identifying who our students are, what are the things that they, they're scared of, especially for our low income, um, you know, black and Latino kids, right? Uh, and be able to provide them the support just in time. I think that's critical and not necessarily something that you have to invent. We have all the resources available to us. We can start doing it now. It's uh, being more intentional about how we apply yeah, it. Yeah, and know who your you know who your users are, right? Like at the yeah. end of the day, you know, we, you have to focus on who your users are and solve their problems, right? That's really what it comes down to: is how are you solving your users' problems, right? At Google, we think about that all the time. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you know, uh, you, users don't even know they have a problem, right? I, I often think <laughs> about remember, you know, did did you mean in Google search results? We didn't ask our users if they wanted a spell check, mm -hmm. right? We just looked at how they were spelling things and realized that most of the time they were spelling things wrong. So we used that data to produce, you know, a spell check in a search bar. We didn't ask our users. So, you know, don't ask your users to identify what problems that they have and solve those problems. And I think that's pretty easy to do. Terrific. Thank you so much for your input. Thank you very Appreciate much.